You're tuned into the Writing Community Chat Show, the live streaming YouTube podcast that brings you the stories of authors, screenwriters, and more. Indie or established, this show's for the community. We invite you to be a part of it. Head to the writingcommunitychatshow.com for more info. The WCCS, together as one, we get it done. Hello and welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show. Th- that didn't work, Chris, did it? Yeah, it did. Did it? Yeah, <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, it froze on my screen. Welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show. We enter with chaos, as always. Uh, it's Friday, yes. Finally, it's been a long week, and I'm happy to made it, to have made it here. I uh, really am. Chris, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm very good, thank you. Um, threw you off a little bit, that, did it? It really did, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a bit iffy, uh, jumpy at the moment. I'm not sure why, um, you know the internet uh occasionally iffy it can be but yeah happy to be here chris uh we've got a great show coming up uh we've got a great guest and there's been a lot of things going on in the background hasn't there we've got we've got a few things we want to talk about um beers beards and books is on week number four this weekend chris yeah um it's quite interesting uh beers beards and books because obviously I, i've never tracked my beard to such an extent as to oh it's week four day number three things like that um so yeah that that's only gonna i can't imagine what it's gonna look like at the end of the 52 weeks it's just gonna be horrendous yeah i mean how how is it feeling is there kind of um is it itchy have you gone through any phases yet what's that like uh no i'm still in the phase of the honeymoon phase i suppose it's it's coming in it feels good uh it looks looks a bit better um i had a dream last night though that i was like midway through the year like 30 weeks in and i went for a haircut and the barber when he finished he just um Ooh. used the electric razor on my beard and he took like a layer of my beard off and i was fuming because it was just a strip and i had to come on here and explain why that <laughs> happened um so if that does happen then that yeah. wasn't a dream that's a premonition so you've we'll got speak. uh you've got basically got beard um challenge anxiety now yeah maybe 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 that wow. is the case. i yeah. think that is that is a thing i mean yeah it's great i mean has has the other half mentioned no no anything? we don't talk about it she's she's already nope. against it so um <laughs> it's already losing yeah. battle she won't be here yeah. at the end of the 52 weeks i should imagine she, she would have moved up <laughs> would be the beard, bearded homeless ex yeah <laughs> Um, so beards, beers, and books. Episode four is dropping on Monday. Um, I have done the beer review already for that, and I gave a little teaser earlier. It was mm. it was very nice. Um, it was actually the first five out of five I've given Chris, and you'll know the past couple were f- two and a halfs. Uh, nice. So you know it's it's done pretty well, mm. and I'm looking forward to drinking more random beers as we go through the 52 weeks. Uh, also. The Beer Token book promotion is back, Chris. This is a brand new thing. Uh, it's not a brand new thing. It's an old thing we're bringing back and we're really excited about. It's a great way for us to build, build a little bit of income for the show to help this keep going. But it's a great way for you to very cheaply promote your book to an audience um, of ours, whether it's through the podcast listens or the uh, visual viewers that see the show. And we'll throw in a few bonus tweets for that those people as well. So if mm-hmm. you're interested in advertising your book on this show, you can email us or drop us in a message on Twitter or social media, and we will get you the details for that as well. Um, Chris, yeah. that was very successful before, right? Yeah, I mean, it was great before. I mean, what other show gives you the opportunity to you know, promote your own work when we've got such amazing guests? I mean, tonight's guest is like the gold standard of crime writing. I, I am a, obviously a massive advocate for crime um, and you know, reading the crime genre, and tonight's guest is... The cream of the crop in my opinion um i can't speak wow. highly of tonight's guest so you know it's an absolute pleasure to have him on and mm. you know it's a missed opportunity for somebody tonight to that, promote that is a cer- certain yeah of course that's a, a big praise as well chris because i know you do certainly love um the crime genre and we've had a lot of good guests from the crime genre because of that um yeah excited for tonight's show uh, and the book i have not read five decembers yet 
I am very, very intrigued by this book. I've been looking up, obviously, for research for the show. Um, super intrigued, and that will be added to my library, definitely. Um, as you know, uh, good, I like the history, especially in World War II. Um, so we'll get onto that very, very soon. Anything else you want to chat about, Chris, this week? Anything good happened? Oh, go on. Go on, you remember. We talked about this in Thursday's space on Twitter. I forgot we were nominated like two hours long. <laughs> we were nominated for something, which is very cool. Oh, the, the Queer Indie uh, nominations in the Ally uh, categories for both of our forgotten books uh, that we never mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the un uh, the un uh, marketed books of Chris Uli and Chris Agate. Uh, yeah, uh, QIQueerIndie.com. Um, fantastic members of the uh, uh, LGBTQ community. Um, have created an amazing website. Um, Halo Scott, Mario Delalio, um, many others. Um, sorry, I don't mention you. There's, there's like seven people there. Um, but you've created something amazing, and we're allies of that. And, um, and they have a fantastic website showcasing a lot of indie authors and their allies um, as well. And they've created this is the third year, I think, the QI Book Awards have been around. Mm. I want to say third, which is incredible. So, congratulations for that. But also, thank you very much for, for nominating our books. It was a real pleasure. Yeah, it's like going to the bottom of an archive bin to find out. <laughs> like, I'm sure they did do something at some point. Yeah, they wrote a book. I, I, I saw, a, if you've got Facebook, it comes up with memories from years ago. And today, it was like three years ago, you, you advertised this book. Um, Hello says, I bribed Agate with goat corpses to say all this. Uh, yeah, so three it came out three years ago. You advertised this. My my book, my first book, came out in 2019. How crazy is that? Yeah, it's pretty mental. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, right. Yeah, let's enough. get I've got tonight's guest on. <laughs> get on with the introduction, my friend. I am. I am. I am. I'm getting there. All right. I'm sorry. I'm excited. It's Friday, and and January is nearly over. It's nearly there. We're nearly there. Um, and I say that it's my birthday in the middle of January. It sucks. What a sh shocking month it is um anyway tonight's guest is the author of five decembers as you can see chris up in the top corner uh it's currently has a whopping 2425 reviews on amazon in the uk with an average of 4.6 out of 5 which is which is amazing but even more impressively uh, on goodreads which if you know goodreads is a horrendous place to be um it has 4540 reviews and an average of 4.5 out of 5 um, that speaks for itself, honestly. Goodreads is horrendous. Uh, yeah, it was I mean, a way. I was going to say they're all great, but surely my opinion should reign supreme. It's amazing. Go and get it. Go and buy it right now, and then come back and watch the interview. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, don't do that. Watch this first, then buy it. <laughs> um, it. It was the winner of the 2022 Edgar Awards for the best novel, nominated for best thriller in the 2022 Barry Awards, and finalist for the Hammett Prize 2021. Uh, that is all amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome James Kestrel. Hello, James. Hi, thanks for having me on. Uh, we, we are delighted that you joined us, James, and thank you so much. We hope you're having a good week. How are you doing? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing okay. It's been a, a pretty wild week. Um, I, I have a, a house on, so I, I live in Hawaii on the island of Oahu, and I have a place on the big island uh, about 200 miles away and wow. I'm selling that house and I had put all of my favorite things from that house in a, a storage unit and I got a notification this week that there had been a fire there and I needed to go over there and clear out all my crap or they were going to throw it away which no. didn't seem like a very nice approach to telling your customer that they had had an accident. But so anyway, this evening I'm going to hop on a plane and go over there and take care of that. And so hopefully. Oh, that sounds horrendous. <laughs> yeah. Do you know like kind of the level of destruction that might be or is the uh, no fun? idea? They told me that it could all be burned to a crisp where it might just have smoke damage or it might have water damage. Oh my uh, goodness. So, yeah. Wow. Well, well is... fingers crossed for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to leave you in suspense like that, guess what? It could be burnt to a crisp or it could just be a bit of singing <laughs> around the edges. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I would definitely want to know more. Um, especially yeah. if I have to get on a plane and go and sort it out. But I hope you give them a PC of mine when you get there, James. Yeah, I will. Yeah. It, it, it's, the, it's a company called uh, Keep Your Storage in Suspense. Um, 
dot com or something like that you know um <laughs> yeah brilliant well hopefully that's all good for you and and it's not that bad and you can re- uh, salvage a good few things but also um amazing to live in hawaii how is that um obviously you've lived you you weren't born in hawaii or no I, yeah so i i was born in california um in palo alto um and then when i was really young my so my dad was a a university professor and he got a better offer at the University of Texas. So we went from Palo Alto to Austin. And then I spent the next 13 years of my life plotting ways to get out of Texas <laughs> um, and and finally succeeded in going to a boarding high school in Michigan wow. uh, where I majored in creative writing. And then um, then I embarked on like a five year journey of dropping out of most of the colleges in North America uh, and finally graduated uh, from one uh, this really dodgy college in San Francisco called the New College of California that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but at its height, it had 200 students and the campus was a former funeral home. Um, so it had these things in it that looked wow. kind of like like uh, dumb waiters from an old hotel, but they were coffin sized. So the the anyway, it was a weird place to go to school, but but wow. they left me alone and let me write, and so that's what I did. And then after that, I I lived in Taiwan for four years, and I I was teaching kindergarten there, and I also I opened a bar there, uh, which was. <laughs> It was probably Taiwan's first <laughs> yeah. restaurant, um, and so that was that was kind of fun. And then I came back to the U.S. and went to law school in New Orleans, Louisiana. And then uh, I was there when Hurricane Katrina um, just devastated the city. So I figured after law school I would go somewhere else, um, and I came out here. So I've actually lived wow. in Hawaii now longer than I've lived anywhere else, um, wow. but That's because incredible. I wasn't because I wasn't born here, I will always be an outsider. Wow, that is an amazing story. And we're gonna have to ask questions about some of those things. <laughs> um, but living in Hawaii, what is that like? For, for me, who's never really left Wales, um, well, kind of lived in England for a little while, I'm very untraveled. What is Hawaii life like? It It's amazing on several levels. Like, I mean, first there's just the natural beauty of it. it I mean, the ocean is gorgeous. Um, I can look out my office window and see humpback whales. Um, oh, and, come on. <laughs> and there's you know, green mountains and lush, lush jungles and waterfalls. And then, and then you have like, you know, the live active volcano. So my house on the big Island is two miles away from the summit of Kilauea. So, you know, I can, after sunset, go over there and just watch a bubbling lake of lava, which is crazy. Wow. And, and so, so all that stuff is great. Uh, but the other thing that's really great is the the people here and and just the the society in Hawaii is distinctly different than everywhere else in the U.S. And after living here for so long, I couldn't, I can't imagine living anywhere else in, in the mainland U.S. That's um, fascinating. And, and you know, I mean, one one interesting thing is the white people are a minority here, um, and and so between New Orleans and and living in Taiwan and now Hawaii, I, I've spent most of my life in places where white people are the minority. And it's, it's a much uh, better society that gets built when that happens. <laughs> uh, it's not that white people are bad, they're just like salt. You don't wanna put too much of it in her. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to, to delve into. We love to go rewind the tape. And that's normally the first question is, you know, how did you get into writing? And you kind of touched on it very briefly there. But before you started your creative MA, what was the inspiration to go in that direction? You know, what was like the spark of, oh, I love writing, I love reading books, perhaps? Or mm-hmm. what was the inspiration for you? Um, so so I had I had always loved reading books as a kid. Um, and I, I had tried writing my own stories before I could really even spell, um, and so they were bad. Um, but so I so I had always wanted to write stories, and I always enjoyed writing stories. And then when I was in the sixth grade, um, 
over a Christmas holiday. So it was like two weeks in the winter. And I found in my dad's study Stephen King's book, It. And, and I'll always remember that Christmas break as like the most magical two weeks because I was just sort of under the covers in my bed reading this book, scared shitless, <laughs> and, and, but just transported by it. I mean, it's such, it's so much world building and character building in that book. And, and after that, like, I just, I wanted to write a book, uh, write a book like that. And, um, and so I, I was, I was really sure I wanted to be a novelist at least by middle school. And so, you know, then I went, I went to that high school where I got to major in creative writing and then I focused on that in college. Um, and then after college, I, I was, you know, confronted suddenly by the fact that I, I had a, a degree from a school that was sort of a joke. And it was a degree in creative writing, and I was essentially unemployable. But then I found out that anyone with a, a American college degree or a, or a UK or anyone with a college degree from an English speaking country can get a work visa in Taiwan and many other Asian countries and and teach. Um, so I became a kindergarten teacher in Taiwan, and my thought going over there was like. You know, I I can teach, and that way I'll have a way to make a living. And I I can study Chinese, and maybe that will give me some different perspectives on on my own language and help my writing. And then you know, someday I'll write the great American novel. And and what ended up happening is I I moved to Taiwan and I studied Chinese and I taught and I suffered a ten year stretch of writer's block. And wow. like at the at the time that I moved over there, I had already written three novels um, that I wrote like between the ages of twenty and twenty two, and none of those books ever got published. Although I did have an agent for one once, um, and and so you know I went to Taiwan thinking I'm going to start my fourth novel, but it just never happened. Um, and so then uh, when I when I graduated from law, well, so I guess eventually at some point I realized that while I was in Taiwan, I was making, uh, I, for some reason, I always remember this number. I was making $19,411 a year as a kindergarten teacher. And it just occurred to me at some point that if I went to law school, I could increase my standard of living by a lot and, and do that until I wrote the great American novel. And, wow. and so becoming a lawyer was always just sort of cover for my long-term goal of writing. And uh, now I'm, I'm pretty heftily dug into being a lawyer because um, I, I would have to make a whole lot of money from my books before I could back away from this because like my kids are in private school and stuff like that. So, but, but uh you know, after I got out to Hawaii, uh, it was just like my mind opened up again all of a sudden, and, and I just started writing books. And I, um, you know, I, I wrote the fourth one and then the fifth, um, and those both got published, but in a small way. And then, like, my uh, the sixth through ninth books all got published um, by a legit publisher, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And, you know, they were published in translations and I was optioning film rights and stuff. And then, but, but they didn't sell well. Um, and so then I wrote Five Decembers and that, that was a kind of different book for me. Mm. I find that fascinating. Like just your whole life story has just got so many questions with it. But <laughs> do, do you think that the writer's block was because your, your life was so busy in terms of, you know, being a kindergarten teacher, opening a bar, then deciding suddenly that, you know, I'm going to be a lawyer until I write this amazing book. Um, obviously, a lot of time taken up doing other activities other than writing. So, yeah, I, playing it? I, I think the, the busyness was some of it. I think also I just kind of felt unsettled in my life. And like, I just felt like I, you know, I, I was sort of worried about the future and what I was going to be doing and where I was going to be. And but once I got to Hawaii, 
you know, I got a really good job and, and my wife and I bought a condo in Waikiki. And then, and, and then the, the thing that finally really kicked it off is, is we got this, I, I've always been like really, really into boats. Um, like I, I love boats uh, and sailboats. And so we bought this old sailboat. Mm -hmm. It was a, a 34 footer and a really nice interior cabin and everything. And so I, I started, the marina was between my office and my condo. And so I would stop by the boat on the way home, uh, just kind of, you know, at first to like mess around with things in it and, you know, fix things and maintenance. And But then it just kind of became stopping by the boat to hang out on the boat and and it, it just i mean this this boat had was older than me and had been around the world a couple times and, and, <laughs> and you know sometimes when i was cleaning out the bilge i would find coins from distant countries and and it just it just kind of it was like sparking stories in me it just it just wanted me to like create adventures in my head and so i did so i just started dropping by the boat to ride after work and and it, it went pretty well mm. Mm. chris we gonna jump in there you, yeah you well i was gonna say we've never had an author in. yeah i was gonna say we've never had an author that, that you know it, their writing practice is on a boat like we've had somebody in the middle of the woods in sweden uh but a boat <laughs> does sound idyllic in that respect you know it, it almost the impression that I'm getting is that when your mind started to calm and you moved to Hawaii, mm -hmm. that's when all the creative juices started to, to flow as well. And, um, you know, that's been obviously really productive for you in, in that respect. Yeah. It, I, unfortunately I don't have the boat anymore. Um, and, um, I, I wrote most of five Decembers in bars, actually. Um, I, I find bars to be really great places to write. Mm. Um, there's there's this bar. So my, my office is in downtown Honolulu, and it's right next to uh, the historic Chinatown district, um, which uh, is still pretty sketchy, but it used to be really, really sketchy. And it was the, the red light district, and there was... Uh, during World War II, the Navy uh, actually regulated prostitution there, and, um, mm. and and so the the bar where I wrote most of Five December's is a very gentrified, upscale place now. But it used to be a brothel, um, mm. and and uh, it, it was a, a Navy-run brothel, which meant that that they had a set price. It was three dollars for three minutes, um, and. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying uh, nothing. <laughs> yeah, I love the idea of that. I absolutely, I mean, that makes me love Five December's even more. That that's where it's written. Um, but I, I suppose if we get on to Five December's a little bit, um, where did the idea for McGrady come from? Um, and why did you want to explore that area, that period, time period in particular? Because, you know, you could have quite easily set it in modern day. Um, right. Um, well, I, I mean, I had always had a, a fascination with World War Two and World War Two stories, and um, my my grandfather and, and my great uncle were both um, in the Army Air Force during during World War Two. They weren't in the Pacific; they were stationed in England um, and then France. Um, but so so they always had really great stories, and and I kind of wanted to give back something there, but. The, the real catalyst for me is uh, right before I started writing the book, I, because of one of the cases I was working on at, at my law firm, I was traveling back and forth between Tokyo and Hong Kong and Honolulu uh, quite a lot. And, and so, you know, whenever I get to a new city, I like to walk around and, and you know, just get to know the city on, on my feet. And and so just walking around tokyo and hong kong and i have i have some really good friends in tokyo who you know started out as clients but became close friends and and they showed me around tokyo and and knew my fascination with the history and tokyo's tokyo's got a lot of history but you have to really look hard for it because the americans leveled the entire city um, and so most of what's in tokyo is built after 1945 uh, but there are pockets where you can find older things, and so they would show me those. 
and and then Hong Kong is just great. Um, but so you know, I was I was going back and forth between these cities, and I knew I wanted to write an, another novel, and I wanted to write something that was bigger than anything I had tried before, because all of my other books took place in very compressed timelines where, you know, the whole story plays out more or less in real time over the course of a few days or a week or something. But I wanted to write something that was like bigger where, where the passage of time would allow the characters to grow and change more. And, and, and I, I wanted to write something that wasn't just anchored in one place, but went to many. And, and so, you know, I, I think what happened is I was, I was sitting on a China Eastern Airlines flight from Honolulu to Shanghai so that I could get to Hong Kong. I was just kind of looking out the window, just watching the Pacific down below. And, and I was thinking how Honolulu and Tokyo um, and to a lesser extent, Hong Kong are all really, you know, tied to each other because of that war. And, and you know, they have a shared history and, and, and they all came out of it in different ways you know, different than they were before and, and they're different from each other because of the outcomes of the war. And and so I, I was just thinking, you know, playing around with the idea of, you know, how can I write a story that ties all these together? And then it just kind of out of nowhere, this character of Joe McGrady came along and, and it, it was, and then very quickly after that, I realized that I had the opportunity to do something very weird with a mystery uh, we, I don't think it's a huge spoiler to say that that uh, in this book, once World War II starts, the whole mystery plot takes a, a 90 degree turn and the main character's life becomes about survival and, and, and just managing his way through the war. And then, it, and then it picks up where it left off. And I just, like, I seriously wondered whether I could pull that off uh, mm -hmm. without making it all disjointed and bad. And so, so I just, I had to try it. So I did. Mm. Uh, I, I love that. Um, I'm just taking Agat off the screen cause he looks like he's had a technical blowout. Um, but that's great for me because I just get to chat to you by myself. <laughs> so the start of this book absolutely gripped me. Um, with the again i'm not going to go into too much detail to, to avoid spoilers but the scene that he is presented with um was so vivid for me um it it was up there with the the sort of hannibal lecter style um crime scenes if, if that makes sense um and that was just a catalyst for me to just like burn through the rest of the book um so where did that particular scene come into your mind and why did you decide to start the book with with something along those lines um i don't i don't know i i've always I, i've always been drawn to to sort of dark literature and, and darker stories um and and i wanted the crime that that set this thing in motion to be a very violent crime uh just so that it could keep up with the war <laughs> yeah. um, and um and, and i i felt confident doing it especially like the later autopsy scenes um mm. so under under my real name i wrote a book uh once called the poison artist and it, it had um a bunch of autopsy scenes in it. And so to research that, I managed to talk my way into the Honolulu medical examiner's office. Um, and they were they were really reluctant to deal with me at first because I, I started by emailing them. And my email coming from a law firm has all this crap down below about, you know, this is a legal email. And so, so I think they were scared I was trying to set them up to sue them for something. Uh, but once they realized that I was coming at them as a mystery writer, they're like, oh, come, come, please, you know, put us in the book. Um, <laughs> and, and so they, they knew I was interested in drowning victims um, in particular. And so they, they would um, call me when they had one so I could go down and watch. Um, and, and sorry, you know, I just, I just confused between drowning victims and drowning victims. Um, 
I, I misinterpre- misinterpreted that for you really liked it, drowning victims. Mm. No, not, not drowning any victims. No, yeah. Liked, yeah, yeah, you like to, you wanted to go and see more about yes. that. I, get I think that, he bit. he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, victims of drowning. How about that? Yeah, um, yeah. and and which is you know. Um, being Hawaii, that's not an uncommon outcome here. Um, so, um, yeah, so they, they would let me come and watch, and and I got sort of a feel for how autopsies go in real life. Um, and I, I thought it would be fun to put some scenes like that in the beginning of Five Decembers, but, you know, make it more, uh, more a little more primitive since it's the 1940s although you would be surprised how primitive a, a 2020s autopsy is i mean they they open up the chest with like pruning shears that they buy at the hardware store wow <laughs> is, is that I mean, kind of the most obs- obscure research you've done for writing or or is there something kind of even trumps that uh that that may be the the craziest thing i've done i like i um yeah i mean i like i would interview a lot of people and and go places to to look at things um um but yeah i i i think yeah they they once left me alone in the they have this walk-in freezer that had like 30 or 40 dead bodies in it and they just let me what? stand there and <laughs> close the door <laughs> it was just i know some of our audience would love that mm. I, I, obviously yeah. i've what, read what those. did you, what did you... sorry, sorry I get, um i said obviously i've read those scenes and they when i was reading it i remember going oh like because there's a bit where they they straight try and straighten the body out um and it was so again so vivid for me i was just like whoa like i've not really experienced this before in a book um Mm -hmm. and we get a lot of writers that watch the show um so what advice would you give to them that uh you know to be that little bit braver and to you know describe the scenes uh and the violence in the way that you've done it because i think it makes it for such a better read because it's so it's so vivid Mm. Uh, but not in an off-putting way. So would you give anyone, and have you got any advice for anyone basically who wants to try and be brave and... and... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I I would say that my my books are very violent and I, I tend to forget that because I'm not so much focused on the violence when I'm writing them, I'm focused on other things. Mm. Um, but I often will read reviews that's like, you know, holy shit, this is really gruesome. And, <laughs> And, uh, or, or, you know, I'll hear it from my mom. Uh, but, but I, I would say that the first thing is that the, the violence has to, to serve some purpose for the story. And, and, you know, it, it shouldn't just be gratuitous and, and it, it, it should be handled carefully. Um, and I think probably the best way to do that carefully is to, you know, do things like go to autopsies and do things like, you know, if you've never shot a gun, uh, it would probably be a good idea to go to a firing range and, and shoot a bit uh, before you start writing scenes with guns, um, you know, and and without earphones on because, you know, if you, in real life when they have these gunfights they're not wearing hearing protection and you know your ears are ringing for a long time afterwards especially if you shoot at a gun inside uh so yeah i think that that if you if you can capture realistic details Hmm. that let the reader know that you know what you're talking about it's easier to get the reader to come along with you on something that's you know otherwise fairly dark because at least they know that you're not doing it just to upset them, but that no. you have some purpose. Oh, that's brilliant advice. Yeah, yeah thank you. Great. That's a great tip. Yeah, I really like that concept of of letting the reader know or having them trust you on that journey because I've never really thought of it that way, um, mm. and that's a nice way to think about it. Um, very good. Um, going back to the World War Two stories, and you mentioned obviously this family history there. That's kind of some of your interest elements but is there 
was there other ele elements to that interest um, for you when it comes to that history? Um, well, I, it, I, I had always been interested in it, and then in, I as in, oh, go ahead. Sorry, were you, were you saying something else? Or... Okay, um, I uh, no, it's all right. Go on. Um, I was I was just trying to uh, emphasize that question, but you you started answering. So if you could carry on, that'd be great. Okay, yeah, I, I had always been interested in it, but the, after moving to Hawaii, it uh, expanded quite a lot uh, because mm -hmm. I was living in a place that is you know was deeply affected by by the war in a way that pretty much no other place in the United States was. Um, and, and, uh, you know, the, the marks of that are still all over the place. And like, for example, I, I have a, a friend who, who has, he built an airplane and he keeps it at this, uh, old airport out on the West side of Oahu. And, and that airport has, old seaplane hangers on it um, that date back to the 1930s. And is if you're walking around them, you can look up at the glass and there are bullet holes in the glass that mm. were, were put there by Japanese zeros strafing uh, the, the airport on December 7th. And, and so, you know, I mean, there's, there's physical marks still there and, and you can go find them and it's really interesting. And, and, uh, another interesting thing to me anyway, because I'm just sort of a nerd about these things, is the the battleship Missouri is here in Honolulu, and it's a museum ship now. Mm. And and it is sitting in Pearl Harbor. Uh, and so the, the, the battleship is where, they, where the Japanese signed the surrender document. And on the deck of the ship, they have a little bronze marker that shows exactly where that happened. So you can you actually stand on the place where World War II ended while wow. standing also in the place where it started for the United States. So it's just kind of a, you yeah. know, a full circle there. But. I love that. Do you think your attention to detail is something that you've always had at the forefront of your mind or do you think it's developed over you know the different careers that you've had and like i suppose my question mm -hmm. is as your writing process changed from when you before you became a teacher and then you went into the bar work and then you became a lawyer yeah that... it, it's become more meticulous um and, and the other thing that has driven that uh that being detail oriented like that is that after publishing several books, I found that um, weirdos on the internet who get online at 3 a.m. and find my email address to point out mistakes in my books, there, there's a lot of people like that. And and so, you know, they, they'll send me an email that's like, I, I see, sir, that you do not understand the difference between concrete and cement, whereas I have a PhD in material <laughs> science. And it's just like, oh, fuck. Mm. And, and so well, writing a book about World War II, I knew that there were going to be like infinitely more people like that if I got anything wrong, because, you know, there mm. would be people who know like every detail about the airplanes and the schedules and <laughs> and what happened when and and th thankfully so far i've only gotten uh one such email um mm. at, and, and it was very friendly um so that's good i suppose my next question is sort of like in two parts um the first is how did you react to the success of five decembers and as has that changed you as a writer in any way and also how did the hard case crime um link come to be um interesting question so uh, i'll i'll st start first by talking about how i ended up with hard case crime um so uh, this book was really hard to get published um and i don't think it was because of the book but it was because of me uh so my four books prior to this with houghton mifflin harcourt um that and you know sure i can blame myself some that you know perhaps the stories just weren't that good but i also blame their marketing department like they they did nothing to market those books and and 
as far as I can tell, their their marketing plan was to print the books at midnight and load them immediately into a truck and take it to the landfill. Uh, like nobody bought those books. And so uh, after striking out four times in a row um, with those books, when my agent went out with five Decembers, 26 publishers turned it down. And a lot of them were saying, um, a lot of them were saying, you know, we love the story, but we can't get it past our marketing department because the bookstores will only buy as many books as the author's last book sold. And my last book had sold like 8,000 copies or something. Mm -hmm. And, and so they, so, uh, then, then I told my agent, well, all right, the one place that we haven't pitched it to yet is hard case crime and I love hard case crime. So let's send it there. But when you send it, tell Charles Ardai that I would be willing to change my name. Mm. And so, so she did that and Charles read it and he liked it and, and bought it. And then we came up with the name James Kestrel. Mm. Um, and, and the whole thing, the, the reason for that was just so that we, we weren't ever going to pretend that this was a debut novel or that that I was really James Kestrel. We were going to make it clear that it was a pen name. We just weren't going to say who the actual author was so that they couldn't wow. get on book scan and find out how miserable my sales were. Wow. Um, and so so the ruse worked and and uh, the, the book got great reviews all over and, and sold really well. And it's been translated into 14 languages. Um, Wow. And um, and I optioned the screen rights recently, so that was cool. But um, it the the process of getting the book published was really painful for me, and it, uh, just you know seeing it get rejected again and again. I mean, like my own editor at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt didn't even finish the book before rejecting it. She's like, eh. wow. Like we we can't do another one for you. Sorry, lightning didn't strike, and that's Dude, so it was, that is crazy. <laughs> so it, idiot. So it was just uh, you know it was really crushing, uh, mm -hmm. and, and so to see it then do well, um, you know I felt very vindicated, um, and and uh, you know I, like I was proud of the book and. Yeah, I, I have, for the most part, managed to restrain myself from like gloating at my old editor or something like that. <laughs> I, actually, I would be like hiring a billboard opposite their office. Going <laughs> <laughs> out there every day. Right, here you go. Um, yeah, um, but but it, so you know, all as all of that was happening. Um, you know, the world was shutting down for COVID and, and then, uh, you know, my life got turned pretty upside down because all the, I have young kids and the school's closed. And so, uh, you know, I, I was just, I was just coming off of being super depressed about the book, uh, not selling. And then, and then suddenly finding that it was gaining traction and, and, and people were noticing it. Uh, but, yeah, I, I haven't I haven't been able to start writing again yet, and I'm, I have some ideas for what I want to write next. Um, and, and I guess I guess I may actually have to uh, follow through on it because I, I just found out like apparently in some interview I actually told somebody what I was planning to do, <laughs> and apparently in Japan when the, so the Japanese edition of my book just came out. And, it, and I haven't seen it yet, but apparently it has a foreword in it written by some guy who like introduces the book and discusses it. And he told everybody in Japan who's read this book that I'm going to write another book uh, mm -hmm. and it's going to have Joe McGrady's daughter in it. And I was like, how the fuck did you know that? I, <laughs> so, but so, yeah, yeah. I, I guess now I have to do that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm not against it. I'm definitely, I'm hoping that happens. Uh, but it is a bit shit that somebody <laughs> put it out there before you could. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I must have put it out there and he somehow found it. I just don't remember yeah. who I said that to or when. 
So is would that be the plan in terms of obviously not what the book's going to be about, but would you go back with Hard Case Crime for another book, or even if you wanted to venture into something completely new, would that, would that be your first point of call? Oh sure, I mean Charles Arda is the best editor I've ever had, and oh. uh, he stepped up for me when no one else would, and he did a fantastic job editing the book. Um, in particular, he made me. Um, rewrite part of the ending that made it much better than what I originally had. Um, mm. it, it took, I had to try like three times before I got something that he agreed with, but it, it was good. He, he made me do that. Um, and yeah, and he, he, he really went out of his way to promote the book. Um, he out of his own pocket hired, um, uh, like a, uh, marketing and promotion team uh, to try and get the book noticed by more reviewers and stuff before it came out. So, mm. it, Hard, Hard Case is a is an interesting company. Um, I, I don't know how much you know about it, but it, it is a one man operation that has a uh, licensing or a printing deal with Titan Books in London, mm. um, and so Charles owns the the hard case crime imprint and is the editor and the publisher and and he's he's uh, I, i'm sure he's making enough money off of it that someone could actually make a living on it on it but he's he's also a managing director of a hedge fund and um and developed one of the first internet email services that was like a rival to yahoo um wow. So, so uh, he's he's not your typical New York editor. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, he is coming on the show, and I'm really looking forward to chatting to him. Um, but we've heard from other authors um, that he's re it's really difficult to get a book um, with hard case crime because, um, you know, obviously the standards are really high. Um, you know, obviously he's he's, he's got to to light the book as well um, yeah he, he told me that that i mean they publish like maybe six books a year mm. and he gets about two thousand to three thousand submissions a year wow. um so yeah it's I, getting in with hard case crime is you know statistically harder than getting into like harvard law school or something but. yeah yeah <laughs> wow <laughs> definitely go on i get you look like you're going to say something then Can he hear us? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry, guys. I'm really struggling. Everything's broken up right now. So, Chris, uh, you'll have to take the reins because I'm struggling to get in the conversation here. No, it's all I right. Apologize. We'll move on to the uh, writing community chat show staple questions because I've just looked at the clock because it, the time has just flown by. Um, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting it conversation really has. we're having. Um, I... One one of the first staple questions is if you could take any character from fiction and make that character your own and have a go at putting them in a story, which character would you choose and why? Hmm. It's a tough one. Yeah, that, is, that is a tough one. Hmm. Um. We've had some really different answers in the past we've um i actually asked michael connelly this question when i met him in person mm -hmm. and he said i'd write harry potter just for the just for the money involved <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can always go down that route yeah yeah i don't know um maybe the judge from blood meridian by cormac mccarthy oh nice That's a fascinating character um or um possibly Ernest Hemingway's Nick Adams um, who appeared in a bunch of short stories and for whom the bell tolls uh, that, that would be a good one yeah no good answer like it and um, the second question that we have um that's again like a staple one is if you could change the ending to any fictional um thing whether it be books TV or film um, what would you like to change the end into and how would you change it? Hmm. Um, it's 
throw it in the tough questions at the end there, Chris. Yeah, well, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, literally, what happens when we ask people this question is all uh, fictional things ever just disappear from your mind. <laughs> it's like, it's like <laughs> yeah, that's <what> I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really does. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind being able to go back and change the endings to a few of my books. You, you, you can skip if you like. You can skip. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep thinking about that. Maybe I'll have an answer for you. But... Yeah. And the last one um, that's a, a staple one before oh, we go on. Oh, to the... oh wait, wait. I just, I, I just thought of something. So uh, and, and Cormac McCarthy's No Country for Old Men, which mm. is a great book, and, and the ending really is – the way it should be hmm. but it it's sad and and so <laughs> so i i would just change it so that that uh Llewellyn's wife i don't remember her name doesn't get murdered by anton sugar at the end of the story hmm. and you know just let the poor lady live in her trailer <laughs> yeah oh, i love that yeah great answer um so yeah, the, the third and final question that we have from ourselves, and then we're going to get some writing community uh, questions because there's a few questions coming in, um, is it's a little bit morbid, but I don't think you'll mind, uh, you know, having spent time in a morgue looking, <laughs> looking at dead bodies hanging up. Um, but it's you're on your deathbed and you're looking back at your writing career. Um, what does success lo look like to you? What would you be happy with? Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I gotta say, I, I, if I never write and publish another book, um, you know, I'm, I'm just very, very happy that five Decembers finally made it out into the world and that when it did, for the most part, people really liked it. And, wow. you know, I, that, because I, like, I, I, I put so much effort into trying to make this into a story that <clears throat> that i liked yeah and so it really means a lot to me that that it it um, resonates with other people too so mm. yeah yeah that's a great answer and obviously now that it's been optioned um how, how do you feel about that obviously it's great it being optioned but are you just <clears> gonna <throat> leave it alone or would you like to have some sort of involvement in it if it ever comes to like the big screen um i you know i so i've optioned two other things before um mm. and and nothing ever came of it but i did get checks that i could cash um <laughs> and and so you know maybe third time's the charm uh, and it'll actually happen and I, I certainly hope so. And, and I, there's there's a, a director who was trying to pick up the rights, and then he got outbid by somebody else. Um, and I, I'm not even sure I'm allowed to say who I optioned it to, but yeah. but uh, the the first guy has remained in touch with me and has let it be known that if if they never do anything with it, he still wants it. So, so yeah, that's good. But yeah, I would I would want to be involved to the extent that I that I was wanted and that I was helpful. But you know, I like you know, there's some things that I just shouldn't be involved in. Like I shouldn't be involved in flying the planes that I ride on. Like I don't know how to fly a plane and I don't know how to make a movie. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a brilliant uh, response. So we've got a few questions coming in from the writing community. If you're watching now and you've got a question for James, um please send them in because we're running out of time, uh, but we'll get them on. So the first one, uh, thank you for this halo, this question, just put it on the bottom of the screen. It's have your lawyer skills helped with writing in any way? Yeah, I, I would, I think so. Um, uh, for one thing, you know, what, what I do is commercial litigation, um, mm -hmm. which means that, that I, get to know a lot about a lot of different businesses and industries uh, mm. through that. And so it, it makes me much more confident in writing about, uh, you know, different aspects of, of industry in the world and, and how things work. Um, and because of being a lawyer, it's, you know, it's put me in the room with, with a lot of people that I never uh, never would have been around otherwise, like in direct conversation with billionaires or governors or senators. Wow. Um, and, and so, 
so yeah, I, I, I've gotten just, and I don't know if that's exactly my lawyer skills or just experiences that I've managed to have because I'm a lawyer. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly, certainly I, I think there's carryover and it goes in the opposite direction too. I think my legal writing has gotten better as I've honed my ability as a storyteller because you know, when, when you're writing something for court, ultimately, you know, you need to keep the judge's attention and you need to keep them like interested and you need to make them believe all the shit you're saying. And so, you know, <laughs> yeah, does that definitely help? Do you approach, you know, I, I'm terrible with um, the actual logistics of being a lawyer. I don't know much about it, but when you do your opening statement um is that the same sort of process as to when you're writing a draft or a short story because you're trying to, like you say, paint that picture um, mm -hmm. and hold people's attention, you know, not just the judge, but, you know, uh, the jury and things like that. Is it similar process or is it a bit it, different? It, it's similar. I mean, it. I, I find that if, you know, when things happen that, you know, go so badly wrong that they end up in a lawsuit, Mm. it it can be best explained as a story um mm. and and when lawyers forget that and they're just like breaking out charts and and you know crunching through technical language that no one understands uh you know the 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 actual story of what actually went wrong gets lost and mm. and so like I, I feel like if you're the master of the story like if you control the narrative um you know, it gives you a leg up. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we've got another question, a couple more uh, that have come in just before we finish. Um, thank you for this one, uh, Malango R. So it says, James, would you like your books to be adapted either for TV, film, or graphic novel form? Uh, obviously, we've uh, touched on that a little bit, but not the graphic novel yeah. element. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would certainly love to see TV, film adaptations of all of my books um and i the graphic novel question is interesting I, that had never occurred to me until just now um but yeah that that would be cool um uh, yeah i mean let's see if we can make it happen a graphic novel of five decembers would be amazing so yeah definitely i mean someone would have to be brave <laughs> to write some of those scenes uh um, yeah it would them. yeah it would be a very a thick book too it might have to be like a three volume thing yeah oh well, we'd love that though we could yeah. you know do it in sections uh that'd be brilliant um we've got one more question uh if you've got any more send them in uh but this question is from halo it says what's the greatest lesson you learned from so much traveling um Well, and I, I guess probably the greatest lesson and is just that there is so much world out there beyond the United States of America. And, um, Americans, I think, in particular, are guilty of forgetting that um, and forgetting that, you know, there are billions of people who wake up every day and go about their lives and don't give a crap what's going on in America. And and it's it's good to see that and to just keep perspective that way yeah. um also i've learned a lot about great things to eat that i never would have experienced that and so you know i, I like finding strange new things to eat mm. uh, what's your favorite fun. food discovery then that you found that you've been like wow that was amazing um let me think there, in in taiwan um and this uh, maybe i even mentioned it in five decembers in taiwan they have this this uh congealed duck blood soup mm. and it sounds nasty i know but it's <laughs> it's really good i like mm. it um, and and uh yeah pretty much anything you can find on the street in taipei uh is going to be amazing taipei is a great place to eat so is hong mm. kong Brilliant. That's a great answer. And also, Halo, uh, from my experience of traveling, I've not traveled as much 
as James. Uh, but don't forget your passport because uh, you're not going anywhere if you do that. Um, so before we go, um, obviously we're coming up to the hour mark now. Um, can you just tell us, uh, and anyone who is watching at this moment in time or who watches in the future, because obviously it's on the internet now, so it's going to stick around forever, um, where they can find your books um, and where they can find you as well, obviously, where you're... Oh, sure. Um, okay, so uh, for books, if you're in the UK, uh, Waterstones uh, should be stocking them. They, Waterstones online, may, Waterstones did a, a 500 uh, copy uh, signed edition. So, oh, nice. so they're, they're all signed and, I, I, and they're quite special. They, I, I went to Chinatown and I had a, a a Chinese uh, name stamp made, um, so it's got the the characters Hong Soon, uh, which means mm. Red Falcon, but directly translates to Kestrel. Um, mm. So I signed them and stamped them all, and oh. they look nice. Um, I love that. So, We're trying to get hold of one of them. Um, there's a bookstore in London called Forbidden Planet. Um, mm. They they stock it. Uh, Amazon, of course, has it. If you're in the U.S. Um, uh, all Barnes and Nobles carry the paperback, um, and a lot of a lot of independent bookstores have it. Love it. Uh, and where can we find find you if if somebody wants to come and stalk you for a little bit on the internet? Where where should they? Look? Yeah, um, I, I I go on Twitter a lot, so you can look me up, um, James Kestrel on Twitter. Bro. Fantastic. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, James, for coming on. Um, it, we just come past the hour mark. Thank you very much uh, for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you. And I feel like we just touched the surface of some of your life experience um, and all the things that you've done. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, say hi to Charles for me when you see him. <laughs> yeah, well, King Charles, uh, J James says hi. Oh, oh, I thought you met. I thought, I thought that was a British joke, <laughs> but no, it's Charles next week. Um, thank you very much uh, for coming on, and thank you guys for watching the show. And uh, thank you from me, and thank you from Aga. Even though we don't know where he's gone, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, please join us next week when we do have Charles, not King Charles. <laughs> we have Charles and I, uh, the producer <laughs> of Hard Case Crime, coming on next week. Uh, but for for now, thank you. And goodbye. And I'm going to try and close the show now because I've never done this before. Um, so I'm going to try and do this um, and see us out. Oh, I've got a little video. Yeah, end show. Right, that should be us. Thank you very much. Enjoy your weekend. Okay. Thank you. Bye.